El Dorado. Gold has fascinated people for as long as we've known of its existence, sparking an unquenchable desire for more. What is humans' obsession with gold? In the 16th and 17th centuries, Europeans were captivated by the myth of El Dorado, a legendary city of immense wealth in the New World. But this quest for treasure led to countless deaths and brutal executions. Over the years, El Dorado was believed to be a city full of gold, but the direct translation could actually mean the Golden One or the Gilded One, making it a person, not a place. Spanish explorers in South America in the early 16th century heard tales of a tribe in the Andes Mountains performing a ceremony at Lake Guatavita. When a new chief took power, he would ride on a barge into the lake, covered in gold dust and throw gold and precious stones and jewels into the lake to appease the gods. The Spanish wanted to get their hands on all of those precious items in the lake. They even tried to drain the lake in 1545 and were able to find some gold, but not as much as they had hoped. Although the legend persisted, the Spaniards never found El Dorado. Instead, they found gold along the continent's northern coast, fueling their belief in a secret place full of gold. In the 17th century, Sir Walter Riley sought El Dorado in Guiana. He sent his son, Watt Riley, on an ill-fated expedition up the Orinoco River. The expedition led to Watt's death and Walter's return to England, where he was beheaded for disobeying orders in 1618. Archaeologist Eric Klingelhofer from Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, is now trying to locate Riley's base camp on Trinidad. But until he is successful, the legend persists, driven by the allure of finding the fabled El Dorado. Despite the lack of evidence, the desire for the lost city of gold endures. As Jose Oliver from University College London said, I don't think we've ever stopped seeking El Dorado. The poem El Dorado by Edgar Allan Poe adds a mysterious touch, suggesting that the city may be found over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow. This search for the lost city remains a tale of human fascination that one day may lead to treasure beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Do you think El Dorado is still out there? Let me know your thoughts in the comments! Iram of the Pillars for centuries, adventurers like Sir Ranulf Fiennes and Lawrence of Arabia searched for the lost city of Iram of the Pillars, which is also known as at the Atlantis of the Sands. Despite its legendary status, Iram remains relatively unknown and understudied, often dismissed as folklore or pseudo-history. Similar to other myths with factual origins, Iram's roots lie in truth. Examples like King Midas or Viking Berserkers show how real figures inspired exaggerated stories. The legend of Robin Hood also evolved from a combination of Robin, a popular name originating in medieval England, and Hood, which means an individual wearing a head covering, creating a symbol of those fighting inequality. The search for Iram is shrouded in mystery, but it has a historical basis. Its notoriety comes from the Quran, which associates Iram with the mighty tribe of Ad. The Quran describes Ad as a civilization with lofty buildings, succeeding Noah. The people there built monuments on elevated places, supported by large pillars in the land of Akaf, which today would be somewhere in Yemen. But eventually, the city was destroyed by a violent sandstorm, leaving almost no trace behind. European critics once denounced the existence of Ad and Iram of the Pillars altogether, questioning their absence in Abrahamic traditions and dismissing them as legends incorporated into the Quran. The lack of archaeological evidence fueled baseless claims that Iram was nothing but a popular legend during Prophet Muhammad's time. However, a 20th century archaeological discovery completely changed the narrative. The Middle East was, and still is, home to some of the oldest civilizations and ruins known to man. Excavations provided evidence supporting Iram's existence, challenging the perception that it was merely a legend. In 1975, a team led by Italian archaeologist Dr. Paolo Mattier stumbled upon some ancient ruins in the Arabian desert. Among those ruins, they discovered a substantial collection of ancient texts dating back to 2500 BC. In these texts, 
there was a mention of great cities of antiquity like Damascus, Byblos, and Gaza. But to the surprise of researchers, there was also mention of Iram. The location of Iram, however, was not mentioned. Before this discovery, the story of Iram of the Pillars had become distorted over time, turning into a mythical parable that diverged from the Quran's version. The search for Iram of the Pillars, or the Atlantis of the Sands, is a captivating tale rooted in historical accounts from the Quran, and despite skepticism and distortion over time, archaeological findings have added credibility to the existence of this once elusive city. While the location of Iram is still a mystery, concealed beneath the ever-changing sands of the Arabian desert, perhaps one day, maybe in the near future, we'll find it. And now for number 12, but first, it's shout-out time! I want to give a big thank you to Terry Murphy and Nice Therrington for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. Finis Long ago, before the famous pyramids were built, there was a time in ancient Egypt known as the Early Dynastic Period. It started around 3100 BC, when Upper and Lower Egypt united, forming a kingdom that would last for thousands of years. This period was unique and different from the later traditions of Egypt, with no pyramids or obsession with the afterlife. The kings of this era ruled from a mysterious city called Thinis, Egypt's first capital. But despite being mentioned by ancient authors like Manetho and in religious texts like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the exact location of Thinis remains unknown. However, some think it might be near Abydos, or the modern city of Jirga. The first pharaoh of Egypt, Menes, ruled from Thinis. It continued as the capital for 500 years. But after the Second Dynasty's turmoil, a new capital called Memphis was founded, and Thinis began to shrink. Despite losing its status, Thinis remained fairly significant. The city continued to thrive even after losing its capital status. It was a military and political center. Historical records show that as late as the 18th dynasty, around 1,500 years after Egypt's founding, Thinis was wealthy, paying higher taxes than nearby Abydos. This indicates the city's enduring prosperity throughout Egyptian history. While Thinis vanished physically, it left a mark on Egyptian beliefs. It had a temple dedicated to Anhur, the god of war, and was an important religious center for Mehit, a lion-headed goddess. In the afterlife, Thinis gained spiritual significance, associated with an Egyptian heavenly realm, according to the Book of the Dead. Although this city supposedly disappeared, Thinis remains a captivating part of ancient Egyptian history, leaving behind a legacy that shaped the religious beliefs of the people. The Land of Lioness Lioness, from Arthurian legend, is the home of Tristan, the central figure in the tragic story of Tristan and Isolde. Often called the Lost Land of Lioness, this mythical land is famous for sinking into the sea, but it held a legendary presence while still above ground. Some even speculate that it might have been a real city that submerged many years ago, blurring the lines between legend and reality. The tale begins with Tristan, an orphan from Lioness, raised by his uncle, King Mark of Cornwall. Loyally following his uncle's orders, Tristan journeys to Ireland to bring back Princess Isolde, the daughter of King Anguish. She is supposed to marry his uncle Mark. However, a love potion on the return trip sparks a powerful and forbidden love between Tristan and Isolde. The narrative of Tristan, Isolde, and King Mark intricately weaves together an emotional love triangle, with profound themes of unwavering loyalty, heartbreaking betrayals, and the profound weight of tragic choices. The sinking of Lioness occurs in various legends, often after the events of Tristan, Isolde, and King Mark. Although Arthurian legend doesn't explicitly mention the sinking, Lord Tennyson's epic, called Ideals of the King, places Arthur's final battle with Mordred, Arthur's traitorous nephew, in Lioness. A poetic passage from the epic also foreshadows the city sinking into the sea, giving credibility to the lost land of Lioness. Lioness was a significant land with 140 villages and churches. It was flooded by the sea, 
disappearing in 1099 or 1089 AD. While some consider Lyoness a legendary place, evidence suggests a potential connection to the Scilly Isles in Cornwall, England. Lower sea levels in the past could have submerged an above-ground settlement, giving rise to tales among local fishermen about finding remnants of buildings in their nets. The legend even extends to the present, with claims of hearing ghostly church bells of Lyoness during stormy times. The image of a thriving city abruptly sinking into the sea invokes a mix of awe and horror, leaving room for contemplation about the reality behind the legendary tales. What do you think? Do you think the land of Lyoness really existed? Let me know in the comments below. Thule In the 4th century BC, Pythias, a Greek explorer, returned to Athens with tales of a distant land to the north known as Thule, where the sun never sets and the air and sea supposedly form a gel. His accounts captivated the Greeks, and Thule became a legendary northern land on ancient maps. But despite Pythias' competence as an observer, the actual existence of Thule was questioned, and its location remained a mystery. Pythias placed Thule about a six-day journey across the sea from the Scottish Isles of Shetland and Orkney. Ancient Greek maps depicted Thule far north of Britain and west of Scandinavia, leading to speculation that it could be Iceland or Greenland. Iceland was even called Thule in medieval times, but conflicting information fueled a continued search for the true land of Thule. Describing encounters with Thule's people, whom he considered barbarians, Pythias noted humble farmers growing grains and root vegetables. He even introduced the concept of Arctic summer, which at the time was unknown to the Mediterranean world. Thule's inhabitants supposedly taught him about the winter solstice, with the sun setting at a specific point. During summer, there was perpetual daylight, while in winter, the sun never rose. References to Thule persisted in ancient writings by Pliny the Elder, Servius, Orosius, and Procopius, who expanded the legend with claims of a large island inhabited by 25 different tribes. In the 20th century, the Thule Society in Munich, often considered an occult group, linked Thule to the supposed birthplace of the Aryan race. They even attributed superhuman and psychic abilities to Thule's original inhabitants. In 2010, scientists from the Institute of Geodesy and Geoinformation Science in Berlin identified the Norwegian island of Smola as Thule by correcting discrepancies between Pythias's notes and Ptolemy's map. The name Thule also persists on modern maps, recycled for various locations, including sites in Greenland, Iceland, and Arctic research bases. So it's really anyone's guess as to the true location of the land of Thule. Jomsborg Buckle up, Viking enthusiasts, because this next one's for you. A Polish archaeologist may have just stumbled upon the legendary Jomsborg, a once-thriving Viking metropolis that's since been lost to time. Some remain skeptical of this find, though, even with the discovery of an ancient castle on the site. But we'll let you be the judge. An observation tower construction project on Wollen Island in the Baltic Sea revealed artifacts suggesting the existence of a 10th century city. Archaeologist Flipowiak from the Polish Academy of Sciences calls it exciting. He even told the New York Times that these ruins might answer a 500-year-old mystery, the location of Jomsborg. The discovery challenges the long-held belief that Jomsborg was just a mythical mashup of castle and commerce. Jomsborg, shrouded in Viking lore since the 12th century AD, might have been more than a medieval daydream. If confirmed, it would be the bustling hub where Slavs, Germans, and Vikings traded adventurous tales and goods. Imagine it as the Middle Ages New York on the Baltic Sea. Filipoviak's find could be the missing puzzle piece, a fortified military outpost, a lively town, and a harbor for Viking pit stops. The mayor of Volin, Eva Grybowska, senses a Viking tourism boost near the site. Vikings, who are captivating and historically loaded, could turn the island into a history hotspot. 
Grybovska believes that displaying Viking artifacts in a public park would be a tourist magnet. She thinks that if this site is proven to be the legendary Jomsborg, it would draw people to the area. So brace yourself for potential history-making and Viking-loving chaos. Jomsborg might finally get its spotlight, and Wollen Island could become the go-to destination for time-traveling enthusiasts wanting to catch a glimpse into the past. The Lost City of Z Percy Harrison Fawcett, a British geographer, artillery officer, and explorer, vanished in 1925 during an expedition to uncover an ancient lost city in the Amazon. Fawcett's extensive explorations in South America began in 1906. During that journey, he claimed to have encountered mysterious creatures and artifacts, including a giant anaconda and double-nosed Andean tiger hounds. Conducting seven expeditions between 1906 and 1924, Fawcett established amicable relations with locals through gifts and common courtesy. In 1911, accompanied by Henry Coston and James Murray, he charted unexplored jungles and developed a fascination with the idea of a lost city, which he named Z. Fawcett theorized about a once thriving civilization in the Amazon, drawing inspiration from Manuscript 512, an account of ancient ruins in Bahia. Manuscript 512, originally found in 1839 in Brazil, is a 10-page manuscript written by unknown authors. The document describes vast monuments, artifacts of Greco-Roman influence, and other curious sites at an alleged lost city located somewhere in Bahia, Brazil. This city was supposedly discovered by the authors of Manuscript 512 in 1753. The document is now housed at the National Library of Brazil, but in the 1900s, it inspired adventurers like Percy Fawcett to go in search of this mysterious place. Interrupted by World War I, Fawcett served in the British Army and earned distinctions for his service. But after the war, he resumed exploration, making a solo attempt in 1920. He returned once more with his oldest son, Jack, and Jack's friend, Riley Rimmel, in 1924. Fawcett meticulously planned the expedition, selecting travel companions based on their health, ability, and loyalty. Fawcett's theories about Z's potential grandeur, ancient ruins, and cultural significance fueled a century of fascination and exploration. The last communication from Fawcett was dated May 29, 1925. But in January 1927, the Royal Geographical Society declared Fawcett and the rest of his party lost. There were numerous attempts to locate them, but they all failed. There were speculations about their fate, with theories ranging from attacks by hostile tribes to being eaten by ferocious jungle animals. The expedition's last known location, Dead Horse Camp, became a focal point of the story. Fawcett's conflicting coordinates also raised questions, but some speculate that this could have been intentional to prevent others from finding Z. Despite decades of search expeditions, Fawcett's fate remains a mystery. Various claims, including bones and confessions from indigenous tribes, proved to be inconclusive, adding layers to the enduring enigma of Fawcett's disappearance and the existence of the legendary lost city of Z. The Golden City of Veneta The legendary ancient Golden City of Veneta remains a mystery to this day, captivating those who seek its existence beneath the waters of the Baltic Sea. The city, which is often called the Atlantis of the North, was once a prosperous trading center. According to ancient tales, Veneta vanished beneath the sea as punishment for moral decay, with inhabitants ignoring omens of a coming disaster. Described by a 10th century traveler as the greatest of all cities in Europe, Veneta thrived as a significant commercial hub, visited by traders from various parts of the world. It's said that Veneta had a population exceeding 50,000 inhabitants and rivaled the prosperity of Constantinople. The city's destruction came in 1170 AD. The people were warned of a coming catastrophe. There were even signs, including strange lights in the sky and the appearance of a wailing mermaid. 
But despite these signs, the inhabitants, driven by greed and immodesty, were reluctant to abandon their city of gold. The controversy surrounding the location of Veneta persists, with debates on whether it could be Wollen, an island with Viking roots, or Usadom, known as Sunshine Island. Some propose that Barth could be the real location of Veneta, a medieval trade center in Germany. Others speculate that it's buried beneath the mud in Berlin's Barth Baden. Since 1999, Barth has been allowed to call itself the city of Veneta, yet the official confirmation of Veneta's actual location remains elusive. As researchers continue to explore potential sites and theories, the truth behind the myth of Veneta, whether a mere legend or based on historical events, hinges on the discovery of its ancient ruins beneath the Baltic Sea. Aztlan Aztlan, the mythical homeland of the Aztecs, holds a significant place in their origin myth. According to Aztec beliefs, the god or ruler Huitzilopochtli led the Mexica people away from Aztlan to establish a new home in the Valley of Mexico. The name Aztlan in the Nahuatl language means the place of whiteness or the place of the heron. But whether Aztlan was a real place or just a product of myth remains a subject of debate. In Aztlan, as described in various Mexica versions, the land was perfect, located on a large lake with a steep hill called Colhuacan at its center. Caves and caverns in the hill, collectively known as Chico Mostoc, housed the ancestors of the Aztecs. The landscape was abundant with resources, featuring ducks, herons, waterfowl, singing birds, and beautiful fish. The departure from Aztlan didn't bode well for its people, who encountered many adversities along the way. They wandered through lands filled with vipers, poisonous lizards, and dangerous animals before reaching their destined city, Tenochtitlan. Aztlan's myth includes the concept of Chico Mostoc, with seven caves corresponding to Nahuatl's tribes that left in waves to settle in the basin of Mexico. The Chichimecas, a preceding group, migrated from the north earlier on, and they were considered to be less civilized by the Nahuatl people. Accounts of God's interventions and battles during the migration blend natural and supernatural elements. But archaeological evidence and linguistic studies suggest that multiple in-migrations to the Basin of Mexico happened between 1100 and 1300 AD. King Moctezuma I sent an expedition in search of Aztlan, as recorded by Spanish chroniclers. The sorcerers on the journey found a hill in the middle of a lake. They conversed with the inhabitants and met an ancient woman claiming to be the mother of Huitzilopochtli. Aztlan's people were described as immortal, allowed to choose their age. This was in contrast with the mortal inhabitants of Tenochtitlan who consumed luxury items. Debates persist among modern scholars about the reality of Aztlan, but historical and archaeological evidence supports the Aztec migration myth, with waves of different ethnic groups arriving in the basin of Mexico. In Chicano culture, Aztlan symbolizes spiritual and national unity, also representing territory ceded to the United States in 1848. Despite references, like the archaeological site called Aztlan in Wisconsin, the true location of Aztlan remains unidentified. Shambhala, the place of peace Shambhala is a Sanskrit term translating to place of peace or place of silence. It is a mythical paradise. The legend describes it as a realm exclusive to the pure of heart, those who have achieved enlightenment where love and wisdom prevail. The inhabitants are also said to be immune to suffering, want, or old age. The mysterious kingdom goes by various names, such as the Forbidden Land, Land of White Waters, Land of Radiant Spirits, and more. Different cultures, including Hindus, Chinese, and Russian Old Believers, have their own designations for this utopian land. Despite the multitude of names, it's most commonly known as Shambhala, or Shangri-La, across Asia. Usually, discussion of Shambhala occurs within the context of the Kala Chakra, an advanced esoteric and intricate teaching and practice within Tibetan Buddhism. 
According to tradition, Shakyamuni Buddha taught the Kala Chakra at the behest of King Suchandra of Shambhala. Shambhala's meaning is multifaceted, encompassing outer, inner, and alternative interpretations. It's considered both a physical place and a symbolic representation related to one's body, mind, and meditative practice. While some believe in its existence in the Himalayas or Siberia, others argue that Shambhala lies on the edge of physical reality, serving as a bridge to another world. The legend of Shambhala intersects with prophecies in the Kala Chakra, foreseeing a future conflict between forces of materialism and the mythical kingdom. The outcome, a victory for Shambhala, is often interpreted symbolically as an inner battle against demonic tendencies rather than a literal war. Despite numerous explorers' quests, including Nazi expeditions, no concrete evidence or location of Shambhala has been established. Various theories place it in different mountainous regions, such as the Sutlej Valley in Pakistan, southern Siberia, or the mountains of Himachal Pradesh. Some legends even suggest a hidden entrance in an abandoned Tibetan monastery, guarded by beings known as the Shambhala Guardians. In essence, Shambhala remains a captivating myth, intriguing some with a belief in its existence, but others dismiss it as a fanciful tale, lost in the mists of legend. What do you think? Let me know in the comments! The Lost City of Kalahari Now let's get into the sandy mystery of the Kalahari Desert, where the quest for a lost city unfolded against the backdrop of arid landscapes and ancient legends. In 1885, American entertainer-turned-explorer William Leonard Hunt, who went by the alias Guillermo Farini, traveled with his son Lulu to the Kalahari Desert. While there, they stumbled upon what seemed to be ancient ruins, large stones cemented together, forming semicircular structures. Despite finding no symbols or evidence of a writing system, Farini believed that what he found was evidence of a lost civilization. Fast forward 130 years, and at least 30 expeditions embarked on a wild goose chase to unearth this mythical city. There were setbacks, though, since Farini left scarce notes about the exact location. Think of finding a needle in a haystack, but replace the needle with the ruins of a half-buried city. In 1964, A.J. Clement took a swing at the mystery. He retraced Farini's steps, but found no human settlements. However, he did encounter some unusual dolerite rock formations. Dolerite, a sturdy rock often forming wall-like structures, might have tricked Farini into mistaking it for a man-made city. But still, expeditions persisted into the 21st century. In 2013, the Marca Wasi project used Google Maps to try to locate this ancient place. And in 2016, the Travel Channel took a shot with aerial surveys and radar. Unfortunately, though, no indisputable signs of the lost city emerged. The Kalahari's dry climate raises eyebrows for some skeptics, since it's a challenging environment for any metropolis to thrive. But hold on to your explorer hat because there is a twist to this story. Let's quickly take a detour to Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, where there is evidence that ancient civilizations once lived in arid regions. The ancestral Puebloans managed a proto-civilization despite Chaco Canyon's dry conditions. And if it happened in New Mexico, that means the Kalahari could have once hosted a similar complex society. Speculation veers between a wetter Kalahari 10,000 years ago and a more recent settlement within the last millennium. But while the mystery persists, doubt grows. No solid proof has surfaced in the last 130 years. What Farini deemed a city might just be a geological mirage. So, should we abandon the hunt or keep looking? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Mount Shasta's City of Light Nestled in Northern California, Mount Shasta stands as a formidable stratovolcano, reaching a majestic height of 14,179 feet. 
Beyond its geological grandeur, the mountain is enveloped in a tapestry of myths, legends, and supernatural tales that have woven themselves into the fabric of its identity. Legend speaks of Telos, the City of Light, a subterranean realm beneath Mount Shasta that purportedly houses descendants of Lemurians. These ethereal beings, described as seven feet tall with flowing hair and adorned in white robes, share their hidden abode with the mysterious lizard people of legend. This detail adds a layer of reptilian intrigue to the mountain's mystique. The landscape of Mount Shasta has become a canvas for UFO sightings, with saucer-shaped clouds contributing to its ethereal ambiance. This enigmatic quality has attracted an array of followers, from esteemed poets like Joaquin Miller to celebrated naturalists like John Muir. Even unconventional religious groups like the Ascended Masters have taken an interest in this stratovolcano. Andrew Calvert, the scientist in charge at the California Volcano Observatory, acknowledges the intricate history of Mount Shasta's eruptions and its visual impact on geologists, spiritual seekers, and technology enthusiasts alike. The mountain's distinct weather patterns, captivating clouds, and icy peaks contribute to its profound allure. Amid contemporary myths and sightings, Mount Shasta holds a deep spiritual legacy for Native American tribes, including the Shasta, Wintu, and Modoc. It's considered a sacred place where the creator god resides and original bones of the Modoc people find their resting place. For Taylor Tupper, a Modoc Indian of the Klamath tribes, Mount Shasta's spiritual significance extends to the realm of Bigfoot, known as Mata Kagni, the Keeper of the Woods. Tupper emphasizes the importance of respecting nature and its diverse manifestations, urging an acknowledgement of the sacredness inherent in the mountain. Philip Dawson, a geophysicist at the California Volcano Observatory, views Mount Shasta not merely as a scientific subject, but as a home intertwined with local spirits and stories. Dawson recognizes the diverse interpretations people bring to places, shedding light on the intricate dance between physical processes and metaphysical beliefs. Mount Shasta remains an enduring mystery. Dawson notes that individuals often find themselves captivated by the mountain's energy, describing it as a place where one can get stuck. When it comes to stories involving UFOs and metaphysical experiences, Mount Shasta stands as a supernatural sentinel, inviting individuals to explore its depths and unravel the mysteries veiled within its majestic slopes. Bethsaida Israeli archaeologists have unearthed two potential areas believed to be part of the ancient city of Bethsaida, prominently mentioned in the Bible. The discovery includes Byzantine and Roman ruins, with one area, called El Araj, featuring remains of the Church of the Apostles. The city, situated at the confluence of the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, is thought to have initially been a fishing village named Bethsaida. However, it was later renamed Julius by Herod Philip in 30 or 31 AD. It's even been said that two apostles of Jesus Christ, Andrew and Peter, lived there. Archaeologists R. Stephen Notley and Mordecai Avium are confident that El Araj is Bethsaida, supported by historical records and the discovery of a 5th century Byzantine church. Another site, Et Tel, which has been excavated for over 30 years, is also considered a candidate. But challenges like flooded pits hinder conclusive evidence. Notley believes that El Araj, with its east-west oriented Byzantine basilica, is the Church of the Apostles. This is backed by an 8th century saint's writings. Excavations revealed a Roman layer below Galilean mud, indicating the existence of a settled city. There was abandonment in the 3rd century, resettlement in the 5th century, and final abandonment in the 8th century that aligned with the historical gap regarding Bethsaida. Roman ruins include a bathhouse, pottery, coins, glassware, and frescoes. But despite claims that Et Tel is recognized by the Israeli government as Bethsaida, Mordecai Avium argues it was chosen in the 1990s when no better candidate existed. As new evidence surfaces, 
the government may revisit the issue, acknowledging the need for a more accurate ID. The Israeli Antiquities Authority anticipates revisiting the matter in the coming years as ongoing excavations provide additional information. Krishna's Dwarka Before we get into this one, it's important to note that there is a modern-day city of Dwarka, but legend says that there was an ancient city with the same name, created by an Indian deity. The ancient city of Dwarka, rooted in Hindu mythology and history, holds immense significance. Created by the deity Krishna, Dwarka is believed to have submerged under the Arabian Sea after Krishna's departure. The city was originally situated where the river Gomti and the Arabian Sea flowed into each other. It's said that Krishna, not the king but the creator, sought and obtained 12 yojins of land from the ocean god for the city. The ocean god agreed and gave Krishna the land, known earlier as Kushastali. Krishna later renamed it Dwaravati or Dwarka. The city, built with divine architects, was often referred to as the Golden City, enriched by Krishna's presence. Pilgrims flocked to Dwarka in Krishna's time and continue to do so today. Only nowadays they travel to the city's modern counterpart, making it a crucial pilgrimage site. Upon Krishna's exit from the mortal realm, coinciding with the transition of the age of Kali, Dwarka supposedly submerged, either metaphorically or literally. Scholars debate the nature of its submersion, with some attributing it to coastal erosion over time, given Dwarka's status as a port city. Archaeological expeditions along the Indian coastline have uncovered submerged walls, pottery, sculptures, and artifacts adding physical evidence to the mystery of Dwarka's existence. But the full scope of this place of antiquity remains to be seen. Despite the historical intrigue, the ancient city of Dwarka remains a thriving spiritual center. The Dwarkadish Temple, also known as Jagat Mandir in present-day Dwarka, stands as a significant place of worship and a notable landmark, continuing to attract devotees and curious minds alike. Thanks for watching! Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed! Lost City of Caesars The Wandering City, or the City of Caesars, supposedly existed once in the land of Patagonia, a great natural landscape spanning much of Chile and Argentina. According to accounts from ancient history, the city was rich in gold and diamonds. The people of the Wandering City were described as having strangely pale skin, and being as tall as giants. The city's existence has been debated for over 200 years, and nobody has ever found evidence that it truly did exist. The origin of the city takes us back to 1515. Spanish explorer Juan de Solis was attacked by Native Americans while on an expedition near what is present-day Buenos Aires. The survivors were forced to trek inland, deep into the forbidding lands of Patagonia. And that was when they came upon a beautiful city inhabited by a race of tall, pale men. Juan de Solis and his men shared stories of the city with other Spaniards. In 1528, Jesuit missionaries and explorer Francisco César went searching for the city, believing it to be an island of salvation. They never found it. In 1540, a ship was wrecked off the coast of Patagonia and about 200 lives were lost. Then, in 1563, 23 years after the disaster, two members of the crew returned to civilization and told the story of how they survived and came across a city filled with treasure. This was supposedly the city of Caesars. And yet, for all these crazy stories and supposed sightings, nobody in modern times has ever laid eyes on the place. Perpericon Perpericon was inhabited starting in 5000 BC. 7,000 years ago, primitive human beings lived on this great forested hill in what is now Bulgaria. The early settlement eventually became a Thracian holy sanctuary and later a Roman town. The history of this lost city is extremely complex. Legend tells us that during the days of ancient Thrace, the Temple of Dionysus was built here. From within the temple were said great prophecies by oracles. In 334 BC, 
Alexander the Great traveled to the Temple of Dionysus to have his fortune told. The oracle told Alexander that he would live to conquer the world, and that was exactly what he did. Oddly enough, the same thing was said to Gaius Octavius when he visited the oracle at the temple in 59 BC, almost 300 years later. He was told that his son, a child who would grow to be the great Emperor Augustus, would rule the world. Perpericon was one of the few places not destroyed by the Romans during their warmongering. It was originally built as a religious sanctuary by the Thracians, but when the Romans took over the territory for good around the 1st century AD, they expanded it into a city instead of destroying it. It was only destroyed in the 4th century when the Goths showed up and smashed everything in their path. In the 6th century, Perpericon experienced a brief revival. Christian churches were built and it became a military stronghold in medieval days. But after the 13th century, the place was widely abandoned and became lost. Now, the historic site is littered with the ruins of houses, altars, tombs, and sacred sites, all on the top of a tall hill overlooking the beautiful Bulgarian countryside. The Lost City of Indiana Jones In Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Nazis discover a mysterious lost city while hunting for the Ark of the Covenant. They found the city of Tanis in Egypt, buried by a sandstorm thousands of years ago. And while most of what you see in the Indiana Jones movie is far removed from reality, Tanis is in fact a real place. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Nazis, and there was no Ark, but it is a real lost city with a shocking past. Tanis was the capital of the 21st and 22nd dynasties of ancient Egypt. It was ruled over by the Tanite kings in what is called the Third Intermediate Period. It became a wealthy commercial center, fueled by the water of the Nile Delta. According to National Geographic, the rulers of Tanis were unique in that they came from Libya, not from the traditional Egyptian families. The Third Intermediate Period was one of the most chaotic times in Egyptian history, with widespread violence, famine, and anarchy. This was a time of weak government and lawlessness, as well as poorly kept historical records. We don't know what happened to the city. It seems to have vanished by 664 BC. And although it wasn't technically buried by a sandstorm, it was lost to the desert. The Nile Delta dried up and the whole place became an arid salt flat. The city wasn't uncovered again until 1939 by French archaeologist Pierre Monte. It was one of the biggest discoveries of the 20th century, with the city found nearly in the exact same condition as when it was abandoned 2,500 years earlier. Otrar The ancient city of Otrar is not the easiest place to get to. It's a ghost town located in modern Kazakhstan, originally a city along the legendary Silk Road. It was one of the most important places in Central Asia, sitting in the middle of a lush oasis. The region, although now totally barren and empty, was once beautiful, but the water has since dried up, the residents have long left, and the city was covered for centuries by raging sandstorms. It was wildly important 2,000 years ago because it sat at a crossroads between China and Europe, the Near East and Middle East, and the tribes of Siberia to the north. It's not clear when the first people lived here, but the first residents were almost certainly part of the Persian Empire around 550 BC. The city then maintained its prosperity up until the Mongol invasion of 1219. Genghis Khan besieged the city, breached its walls, and massacred everyone inside. This led to almost every town within a day's journey being abandoned and covered in sand. After the Khan's death, Ortar rose from the dead to become a bustling trade center once again. It continued to flourish, but things were never really the same. The city was captured by everyone from the Uzbeks to the Dzungars. But it was ultimately the Silk Road losing its importance in the 17th century that caused Ortar to become a lost ghost town in the middle of an unoccupied desert. It's shout out time! Want to say a big thank you to Jen Giesenhoff and Alan Viggins. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Adulis.
Recent expeditions have discovered what could be the oldest Christian church in the Horn of Africa. Three churches were discovered in the ancient city of Adulis, located north of Ethiopia in the little-known nation of Eritrea. The churches are ancient, with one of them dating back to the second half of the 4th century AD. This was just after the Edict of Milan, when Constantine the Great, Emperor of Rome, decriminalized Christianity and took the first step into creating a Christian Europe. What this means is that the church in this lost city was one of the very first official Christian structures in North Africa. The city itself dates back to around the 1st century AD. It was important in the Aksumite Kingdom as a trading hub. It was a stop on a road that was not quite as famous as the Silk Road or the Amber Road, but one that facilitated trade east to west. This was a crucial trading route for much of Africa and one of the core centers that made the Aksumites of Ethiopia so rich. It's unclear what exactly happened to the city, but it vanished from the historical records in the 7th century. It was rediscovered about 1,000 years later on an ancient map, then discovered by outsiders at the end of the 19th century. The city appears to have been flooded, perhaps by a sudden burst from the Uwadi Hadas River. The most interesting part of the city is still the church. The ruin of the old sanctuary is a reminder that North Africa was one of the most powerful and devout Christian regions at the beginning of Christianity. They celebrated Christ long before the religion really took a foothold in Rome. Ancient Sunken Village A sunken village with Viking origins has just emerged in Yorkshire from a dried-up reservoir. Record drought in the United Kingdom caused the water levels of the Baiting's reservoir to plummet, revealing a lost village that hasn't been seen since the 1950s. It was called Baiting's, and it was famous up until it was submerged for its Pack Horse Bridge. The bridge was centuries old, originally used to bring supplies on pack horses through the Pennine Hills. This linked ancient Yorkshire with ancient Lancaster. It's believed the village was settled by people of Norse origins, possibly Vikings, around 1,000 years ago. It thrived in ancient days and then developed rapidly in the Industrial Revolution. But like so many towns that had done well prior to industrialization, Baitings began to suffer in the 21st century. By the time it was decided to flood the city to make a reservoir, very few residents remained. This has been the first time that the ruins of the lost village have been seen since it was flooded. The only other time the reservoir levels fell dangerously low was in 1989. That was when a man named Lawrence Winstanley was found with a gunshot wound to his head and tied to a heavy pickaxe. He had been murdered the year prior and dumped in the reservoir. His murder has never been solved. Kaopeng Established around the year 780, Kaopeng was a thriving Viking town on the western edge of Norway. It wasn't as big as some of the other major Viking towns in Sweden and Denmark, such as Burka and Hedeby, but it was a bustling city and a prosperous place to live. It had high economic importance and was the site of much trade with people from faraway lands. Scholars believe Kaopeng to be the oldest functioning city in Norway. Just shy of 100 years after it was founded, the city ran into some troubles. The land was extremely fertile, and this was making the kings from other Viking territories jealous. Historical records from 813 show that Danish kings battled for control of the region. There are no historical records of any great bloody battles, but it doesn't really matter because by the 10th century, the whole place was abandoned. Other cities such as Tonsberg and Skien rose up in Norway, growing more rapidly and becoming more prosperous than Kaopeng, and the city just kind of fell to the wayside. One theory archaeologists have is that the water level dropped. There may have been a short span of time in which boats could no longer dock at the city, making trade impossible. The city was then lost and abandoned, and only recently excavated in 1956. Stock Kok Thom In the 1980s, the ancient Thai temple of Sadok Kok Thom was used as a refugee camp. Originally a Hindu monument and sanctuary for Lord Shiva, it became a sanctuary for Cambodians fleeing their civil war. The temple was in a state of great disrepair, 
falling to pieces and littered with landmines. The only people who visited the temple were warlords, displaced refugees, and gun dealers. Forty years later, things are very different. The temple of Stok Kok Thom is now a popular tourist site and has been rebuilt. People are coming to this ancient place in the jungle to learn of its mysterious history. The temple was originally part of the powerful Khmer Empire, one of the greatest kingdoms the world has ever seen. It was connected to other major sites, temples and cities, all the way to Prasat Vat Phu in Laos. Construction began in 937 under the rule of King Jayavarman IV, then was completed in 1052. In the 11th century, this wasn't only a temple, it was a small village. People from the local rice farming communities tended the sacred structure. People lived in its shadow, and it was a lively community of Hindus and then Buddhists. It was shortly after the temple was built that it was abandoned. Like much of the Khmer Empire, the temple was lost. The farming communities died, and the whole thing was reclaimed by nature. It was abandoned and lost, and wasn't found again until a French explorer came along in the 19th century. Norea Norea was already a lost city when Pliny the Elder wrote of its existence in the 1st century AD. Julius Caesar claimed it was the capital of the Celtic kingdom of Noricum, located somewhere in the Eastern Alps, most likely southern Austria. The location of this lost city has never been uncovered, nor has its existence ever been officially verified. What we do know based on Roman historical records is that the Celtic kingdom of Noricum was a primary provider of weaponry. These Celtic people had developed an unprecedented method for forging steel. Roman swords may have been made from the best quality steel available, but it wasn't the Romans who made them. They purchased the weapons from the Celtic forge masters. The Celts were forging superior steel starting around the year 500 BC and they became hugely wealthy by trading these weapons to the Romans. In the days of the Roman Republic, prior to the Roman Empire of the 1st century, Noricum was one of their major allies. They traded weapons for protection. It was a formal military alliance, with the Celts operating from their mystical city in the mountains called Norea. In 16 BC, Noricum was absorbed by Rome, and the location of their great city has since been lost. The Lost Cities of Dubai The Desert Kingdom of the United Arab Emirates is rich in ancient history. The great city of Dubai might be one of the most technologically advanced in the 21st century. But just beyond its borders, out in the dry and barren wasteland of the desert, there are lost cities thousands of years old. The truth is that people have been living on the Arabian Peninsula for over 100,000 years. First, it was primitive cave people hunting and foraging. These people later turned into farmers, and eventually civilizations that mastered bronze and other technologies. One of the most important places in the ancient world was the land of Magan, near the modern border of Oman. It was one of the first major suppliers for bronze tools throughout the Middle East. It functioned at a time when some of the greatest cities in Sumer were flourishing, such as Ur and Uruk. Just north of Al Ain, archaeologists have uncovered tombs, buildings, and strange ruins where the stones were cut so precisely, you can't even get a piece of floss between them. The technological innovations here were impressive, especially since the stonework dates back 4,700 years. One of the largest cities found in the region is that of Mleha, that goes back roughly 2,000 years. The city was about a mile wide and was inhabited for roughly 500 years. It was abandoned around the 1st century and slowly covered by sand. It's one of many lost cities out here in the Arabian desert, many of which have never been found. The Hollow Earth Expedition In December of 1923, a pair of explorers named Nicholas and Helena Rorich traveled to Darjeeling, India. They went there to explore the Tibetan Plateau, a land that is still considered forbidden, and the whole point was to look for the fabled city of Shambhala. The two explorers, who happened to be Russian expatriates, were joined by Soviet spies, mysterious cultists, and Mongolian rebels. Everyone had their own purpose in mind for finding the mysterious city, and after a lot of arguing with the authorities, 
they were finally allowed into Tibet. According to Tibetan myth, as well as the Buddhist and Hindu belief systems, Shambhala is thought to be a kind of heavenly city which exists on both the physical and spiritual plane. The city has never been found because it's generally understood to be a metaphor, not a real place. However, Nicholas and Helena were determined to find it anyway. They were convinced Shambhala was real and that it was accessible through a passage in the earth that would lead down to an undiscovered world that was just underneath the surface. In the 1920s, explorers weren't the only ones who wanted to find this hidden city. The English, the Russians, the Japanese, Mongolians, everyone wanted to find this city for themselves. Unfortunately, nobody has ever found it. The expedition lost contact with the outside world in 1927, and the row riches were considered dead. In reality, they had gotten into a violent conflict with the armed forces in Tibet and spent five months in a detainment camp. Afterward, the family walked all the way back to India. They tried to go look for the lost city again in 1933, but this time were denied access to the area. The Arctic Atlantis In the year 1811, Russian explorer Yakov Sanikov was surveying an archipelago north of Norilsk in the far eastern part of Siberia. While he was mapping these islands, he caught a glimpse of another island very far away. He wanted to reach the island to see what it was, but every time he got close, the island seemed to get farther away. This was fascinating because the people of Siberia have long been aware of a strange legend told by the Chukchi people. They spoke of a tribe called the Ankylons, who moved to a mysterious Arctic island long ago. This fabled island became something of a Russian Atlantis, a place that supposedly held a great city and a mysterious lost people, yet nobody seemed capable of finding it. In 1899, the Russian Academy of Sciences invited young and ambitious explorer Baron Edward von Tall to lead an expedition. His job was to discover the island and map it at all costs, and see if it really did hold a lost city. On June 21, 1900, the Zarya research vessel departed St. Petersburg, but the ship did not get nearly as far as the crew was hoping. They got trapped in the Arctic for the winter, pressed on again in May of 1901, and got stuck again soon after. In June of 1902, Baron Edward von Toll took three companions and set off across the ice on their own to reach Bennett Island, where they hoped they could continue searching for the Arctic Atlantis. Sadly, none of them were ever seen again. Paititi Explorers and adventurers have been searching for the lost city of Paititi in the Peruvian Andes for a very long time. Paititi was supposedly the last city of the Inca Empire to fall to the Spanish. It was the final stronghold and the last sanctuary for the Inca before they were fully subjugated and their kingdom came crashing down around them. Yet every scientist and explorer who ventured into the high-altitude wilderness to find this city has been met with either failure or death. Still, to this day, even with the technology we have available to us, nobody has ever found the location of Paititi. The most devastating expedition took place in 1971, when Bob Nichols, Serge Chibru, and George Puel traveled up the Rio Pantiacoya in search of the lost city. Sadly, after 30 days, their agreement with their local guides terminated, and the three explorers were abandoned in the jungle. They could have gone back to civilization, but chose to continue into uncharted territory instead. They were never seen again, and it's generally believed they were killed while making their way through the forest. Lopnur About 2,000 years ago, Lulan was a small but prosperous city on the Silk Road. The city rose up on the shores of Lopnur Lake at a time when the region was much more hospitable. But since the days of the Silk Road, the lake has turned into a vast desert of sand dunes. It's now a place of death rather than life, just northeast of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. The city of Lulan was lost until about 100 years ago, when it was stumbled upon by Swedish explorer Sven Hedin buried underneath the sand. This lost city would soon claim the life of a different explorer, 
a brilliant scientist named Peng Jiamu. In 1979, Peng was elevated to the prestigious position of Vice President of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. One of the things he really wanted to do was explore the Lop Desert. Its lake once contained many different species of fish, and it had been the life source for villages that surrounded it. Even though the temperature here was extreme, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, the ancient people were able to sustain themselves using the lake. However, as the lake dried up, so too did the villages. In 1980, Peng Jiamu walked into the Lop Desert and was never seen again. He had been with his team doing scientific research in this desolate region when he wandered away in search of water and never returned. His disappearance remains a mystery. Australian Outback Ludwig Leichhardt was a Prussian scientist who disappeared in 1848 with seven other men. To this day, nobody knows exactly what happened to him. Ludwig was a natural scientist and he had exploration in his blood. His main point of interest was Australia. He wanted to trek across the Australian outback, making his way from the eastern coast to the western coast. This would involve crossing all the forbidding, dangerous, and unknown lands of the Australian interior on horseback. Ludwig was already a famous explorer in Australia. He had already gone overland diagonally from the east coast to the northwest tip of the continent. It took about 18 months to complete, and he returned from his journey in 1846. Then, after a bit of a rest, Ludwig set out to do an even bigger task in 1848, exploring the middle of Australia. At the time, nobody knew what was hiding in the center of Australia. It could have been lost cities filled with treasure, strange rainforests with curious animals, or anything at all. No one had ever journeyed through the desolate center before, and so this was a big deal. Sadly, it also turned out to be a serious tragedy. Ludwig and his party were last seen on April 3, 1848, at McPherson Station on the Darling Downs. He rode off into the sunset with seven men, 20 mules, and seven horses, but neither he nor his men were ever found. What do you think happened to Ludwig Leichhardt in the Australian Outback? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Land of Lioness The Land of Lioness is supposedly hiding underneath the raging sea just beyond Land's End at the southern tip of the UK. Some even say that on a clear day when the sea is calm, you can just barely catch a glimpse of the last domes and spires of the great city sitting at the bottom of the ocean. According to local folklore, the mythical land stretched all the way from Land's End to the Isles of Scilly. Some have speculated that this mysterious land was where King Arthur fought his legendary battle against Mordred in storybooks. The land was said to be fertile and its people were prosperous. However, it was suddenly destroyed by a fierce act of Mother Nature. Over 2,000 years ago in the 11th century, a tidal wave smashed against the city and drowned it. All its lands and people were lost in the blink of an eye. What's really interesting is that this mythical place could be real. Archaeological remains have been found in high water near the Isles of Scilly. Data has shown that there was a large and rapid loss of land between 2500 BC and 2000 BC. The Cornwall Archaeological Unit has confirmed that much of the land around the Isles of Scilly were lost underwater, suggesting there could have once been a great city and kingdom here. We'll just have to wait and see. Libertatia According to legend, there was a democratic colony of pirates living in peace and harmony on the coast of Madagascar in the 17th century. They used the funds from their pirating to bankroll the colony and built themselves a blissful utopia. They called this place Libertatia, and it supposedly flourished for about 20 years before being swept away and forgotten. However, nobody knows for sure if this place really did exist. What we mainly know about the mysterious pirate city comes from a history of pirates written by Captain Charles Johnson in 1726. Almost all the tales in Johnson's book have been proven true, based on one historical truth or another, and so most historians believe that based on the author's sturdy reputation, Libertatia was a real place. 
The biggest issue is that nobody has ever been able to find it. Journalist Kevin Rushby searched all across the African coast looking for the lost pirate city, traveling through Mozambique, the Comoros Islands, and also Madagascar. He found people who claimed to be the descendants of pirates who had settled in Africa, but never physically found any remains of a real pirate paradise. The Lost City of Z Colonel Percy Fawcett was a British explorer who went on seven expeditions between 1906 and 1924. His obsession was to be the first to discover the fabled lost city of Z. He believed wholeheartedly that somewhere in the Brazilian jungle was a glorious city from long before the Europeans ever arrived in South America. He thought the city was thousands of years old and that it would contain tons of treasure and he would be the first foreigner to ever lay eyes on it. Unfortunately for Percy Fawcett, his expedition in 1925 was his last. He walked into the Brazilian jungle with his son Jack, whom he was hoping would become a brave and bold adventurer like himself. However, neither of them were ever seen again. Since then, historians, explorers, and adventurers have failed to find his remains or understand what happened to him. While we can't be certain what exactly happened to the explorer, there are some theories. The Danish explorer Arne Falk Ron journeyed back to the jungle in the 1960s and learned that Percy and Jack had been killed by an indigenous tribe. They had apparently gotten into a misunderstanding and their corpses were thrown into the river. And yet in 1979, Percy Fawcett's very own signet ring was allegedly discovered in a pawn shop. This led to a theory that claimed Percy and his companions were murdered by bandits and not by the indigenous people. The last theory, and maybe the most realistic, is that Percy Fawcett failed to find the city and was too embarrassed to return to England. So he founded a commune in the jungle and lived there for the rest of his life in secret. The funny thing is that he was right all along, and recent studies have shown that there were once enormous cities in the Amazon. The Seven Cities of Cibola In the 16th century, Spanish explorers believed in the Seven Cities of Cibola, mythical lands filled with so much gold the Spanish would never need to pillage again. This place was supposedly somewhere in the southwest of North America, spoken of by eyewitnesses who saw the brilliant cities for themselves in 1527. The rumor of a great city quickly spread through the Spanish legions that had been pillaging their way across the New World. Then, in 1540, Francisco Vázquez de Coronado began his journey into North America to try and find it. However, his efforts were all for nothing, and he never did discover it. All the Spanish conquistador managed to do was kill huge numbers of Native Americans. He and his company traveled from Compostela in Mexico to what would later be New Mexico, but they found no trace of any city of gold. He destroyed every local community he came across until he learned of an even greater city of gold hiding to the north. It was a legendary place called Quivira, positively brimming with wealth. Coronado's journey took him all the way to modern-day Kansas, but it was too late when he learned that the natives had made up the story about the city of gold. They created it as a way to make him leave, hoping Coronado and his Spaniards would go away into the wilderness and die. He didn't perish in the wilderness, but he did go bankrupt from his expedition. Coronado soon became something of a laughingstock for chasing after a city that didn't even exist. The Failed El Dorado Expedition Sir Walter Riley set out in February of 1595 to find the mythical city of El Dorado. He and his team of English military men traveled up the Orinoco River on the northeastern tip of South America in one of the most dramatic explorations ever. They came across the Spanish settlement of San Jose de Uruna, captured it, and then kept going. They traveled over 400 miles into the Guiana Highlands in search of the lost city of gold, which happened to be on the tongue of just about every explorer in the New World. The Spanish, the French, the Portuguese, the English, they all knew about El Dorado and were desperate to find it. Riley and his team never found El Dorado, but they did venture very far into mostly unexplored territory. As they went, they made alliances with the indigenous people. 
the English were famous enemies of the Spanish, and the Spanish were detested by just about every single group of people in South America. The English used this to their advantage and made friends with the natives. When Riley went back to England, he left two of his men behind with the local Amerindians. But when he got back home, he was received with great displeasure. He didn't bring back any gold, and those who had invested money in his expedition were furious with him. He was accused of hiding his riches in a remote region so that he wouldn't have to share his wealth. Antioch Antioch was founded in the year 300 BC by a man named Seleucus. He was a general of Alexander the Great and one of his best. The city of Antioch grew to be the most vibrant metropolis in the Greek East. Over 2,000 years ago, it rivaled both Alexandria and Constantinople in its size, its civilized decorum, and its citizens' truly modern way of life. Antioch became the capital of ancient Syria and one of the main leaders in the Roman East. By the 4th century AD, the Roman Empire had four major cities from which it could govern most of the known world around the Mediterranean. They had Rome in Italy, Alexandria in Egypt, Constantinople in Turkey, and Antioch, also now in Turkey. Antioch grew into a pulsing beast of new ideas and freedom of thought. It was like New York City back in the day, where entrepreneurs from all over the Mediterranean came together in a melting pot of culture, faith, and new ideologies. There were half a million people living here in the 4th century, many involved in philosophy and art. Then came the fall of Rome. By the 6th century, earthquakes, famines, and outbreaks of disease weakened Antioch to the point that it crumbled. It became buried under the dust of the desert for almost 2,000 years until it was excavated in the 1930s. The Lost City of Cambay About 120 feet deep off the coast of India, researchers with the National Institute of Ocean Technology were doing a routine assessment of water pollution when they found some strange artifacts. They discovered a piece of wood and some other scraps of material they believe once belonged to a city that stood at surface level 9,500 years ago. This would be a major shock to the history books because, up until now, the earliest advanced civilization in India was the Harappan civilization of 2,500 BC. That means there were people here about 5,000 years earlier than previously thought. The evidence for this mysterious city was found in the Gulf of Cambay. What we're looking at here could just be the Atlantis of India, a highly advanced civilization that fell into the water following an unknown catastrophe. Researchers allegedly took acoustic images which revealed geometric formations spread across the seabed. These formations appear to be the remnants of foundations and the outlines of city buildings. One of these structures even appears to have sunken steps going down to a flat bottom, kind of like a swimming pool. We don't know for sure if this really is a lost city yet, especially since these findings were revealed in 2002 and very little new information has been made public. Either nothing is going to come of this discovery, or the information is just being suppressed. Natunia Archaeologists have just uncovered the remains of what might just be a lost royal city from 2,000 years ago. The discovery was announced recently in 2022, although the dig at the site started in 2009. Researchers were held up in the Zagros Mountains of Iraq digging up the city for over a decade. The city fortress compound is two and a half miles long. It was built all along the side of a vast mountain range so that small neighborhoods, huge citadels, carved reliefs, and religious structures were all built into the rock. This city stood at the border of Adiabene and the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire was one of the most powerful in all of Iran and Mesopotamia, according to lead researcher Michael Brown. Adiabene was a smaller, much weaker neighbor. The team found mysterious carvings at the main entrance depicting the worn figure of a king. They don't know which king he was, but he was almost certainly the founder of the city. And as for which city this is, researchers say it could be the ancient lost city of Natunia. The place is only known because its name shows up on extremely old and rare coins. Sadly, we don't really know what happened to the city or the Adiabene, but if history in general is any indication, they were most likely destroyed. These days, very little of their majestic mountain city still stands. There are broken ramparts, 
the foundations of impressive towers, and the ramshackle rubble of houses. All these things slowly breaking apart and falling down the mountain in cascades of shattered stone. The First Capital of Egypt Tijenu is believed to have been the very first major capital of the United Egyptian civilization. The city was supposedly founded during the early dynastic period, when North and South Egypt came together for the first time in history. This was the earliest point in ancient Egypt's history, the first dynasty of Egypt circa 2925 BC. This was the start for what would become the most captivating society in human history. But the beginning of Egypt isn't nearly as well documented as the centuries and dynasties that came after. One of the earliest writers was a man named Manetho. He claimed that a tribal confederation known as the Thinite Confederacy was behind the creation of the city of Tijenu. These people preceded the unification of Egypt, going as far back as 3100 BC. But once Egypt had unified, the Thinite Confederacy founded the very first capital of Egypt and ruled the nation from there up until the founding of Memphis. But here's where history gets a little confusing. Archaeologists and historians already agree that Memphis was the first capital and that it was founded by Pharaoh Menes in 2925, directly following the unification. Memphis is where the Great Pyramids of Giza were built. The lost city of Tijenu, on the other hand, has never been discovered. And it's for these reasons that some don't believe it ever existed and say it was all just part of some ancient fairy tale. I want to give a big shout out to Emily Lindsay and Scott Rubble. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome and be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Himiko and Yamatai Yamatai isn't just a lost city, it's a lost country. Yamatai was a country in Saino, Japan between the 1st century and the 3rd century AD. The name was first recorded in a Chinese text called Records of the Three Kingdoms and was said to be ruled over by the priestess Queen Himiko, who died in 248. Himiko was a priestess or a shamaness elected by her people to lead them after decades of war and strife and today is still the most legendary ruler in Japanese history. Yet scholars continue to argue over who she was and where her vast and mysterious kingdom was located. The location of Yamatai has been debated since the Edo period of Japan. Some scholars say it's located somewhere near modern Yamato, and some speculate it was a small island nation located south in the Philippine Sea. Others claim northern Kyushu, some say the main island of Honshu, there is no way to know for certain because the ruins of Himoko's capital city have never been found. Some believe she was buried in the Nara prefecture at Hashihaka, a megalithic tomb. But it's all just wild speculation. Karakorum Karakorum is the ancient lost capital of the Mongol Empire. The city was built by Genghis Khan's son and may have been one of the biggest cities in the world in the 13th century. And although the city is not lost anymore, we know where it is and many of its ruins are still visible on the surface, but much of the ancient metropolis remains hidden. Most of what we know about Karakorum is based on written accounts of European travelers who journeyed across the earth just to see the capital of the Khans. Mongolia isn't exactly the most agreeable when it comes to archaeology. They really don't like digging up their old monuments. Not a lot of research has been done. At least, not until now. Archaeologists from the University of Bonn spent 52 days looking at an unprecedented area of 465 hectares of land. They used a superconducting quantum interference device to measure topography and magnetic fields underground. This revealed a detailed map of the subsurface surrounding Karakorum. We knew it was pretty big already because of the ruins but it looks like there was even more to the great city. It was much larger than anyone had previously believed possible. The researchers identified neighborhoods spreading far in all directions, including production sites and supply settlements. Sadly, Karakorum had a very short life. It was first established by Genghis Khan in the year 1220 as nothing but a camp of yurts. After Genghis died in 1227, his son Agode turned the group of yurts into a fully functioning city. That city became one of the most popular places to be in the Eastern Hemisphere, a major point on the Silk Road, 
and host to diplomats from all over the world. But by the 15th century, about 200 years later, the city had been entirely abandoned. Atlantis of the Sands There is a legendary lost city in the southern deserts of the Arabian Peninsula known as the Atlantis of the Sands. Legend has it that this city was destroyed by a natural disaster brought upon them as divine punishment from God. That's quite similar to the story of Atlantis, except that Atlantis was tossed into the ocean because of their arrogance, and the old Greek gods grew tired of them. The lost city in Arabia goes under quite a few different names, but is most commonly called Ubar. The first mention of the city was by explorer Bertram Thomas in 1930. He was moving across the Arabian sands with his camel when his local Bedouin escorts described to him a lost city that had been destroyed. This city was supposedly filled with great wickedness, and so God had to wipe it off the earth. Bertram Thomas never found the city, though he spent quite a bit of time digging through the sand in hopes of finding it. He would later pass the story on to Lawrence of Arabia, who took the search for the city even more seriously. Lawrence of Arabia, real name T.E. Lawrence, wanted to take an airship to explore the area but never got around to it. And to this day, nobody has ever found the ruins of this supposed metropolis, said to have been the capital of a great Arabian empire. The Vasai Fort The Vasai Fort in India was once a small yet formidable fortified city. It was a fortress with tall walls and advanced defensive systems but it was also a self-contained community. It had its own hospital, college, barracks for soldiers, and homes for the 3,000 residents. The city was spread over roughly 110 acres of land, and as of right now, is nothing but a broken ruin. The fortress was originally built by the Portuguese in 1536. This was during the era when the Portuguese armadas were spreading themselves along the western coast of India and slowly conquering the port cities. But before the Portuguese showed up to conquer, Versailles had already traded hands multiple times. In the 6th century, Versailles was ruled over by the powerful Chalukya dynasty. It later transferred ownership to the Shilahara kingdom in the 8th century, then fell to the Portuguese in 1514. When they got to Versailles, they built an unyielding fortress to maintain control over the coastline. But this didn't last forever, and by the 18th century, the fortress had been taken over by the Maratha Empire, and the Portuguese were kicked out. But yet again, history shifted in 1774, when the British attacked, and ever since, the fortified city has been slowly decaying. Lost Akrotiri Akrotiri can be found in Santorini, Greece. It's an ancient Minoan city that the Greeks have dubbed their own version of Pompeii. That's because both cities were buried by volcanic explosions. The major difference between the two sites is their age. Pompeii was founded in the year 600 BC and destroyed in the eruption of 79 AD. On the other hand, Akrotiri was founded by the Minoans in 4600 BC and destroyed around 1530 BC. Prior to the volcanic eruption that wiped out the city, Akrotiri was one of the first places in the Mediterranean to practice democracy. It had its own parliament, no royal palaces, and a relatively free society. Excavations in the city have revealed lavish houses two to three stories tall, advanced underfloor heating for the winter, indoor toilets, and hot and cold running water. These people were geniuses and many believe they were probably the inspiration behind Atlantis. The Minoans were on an island, they were destroyed by a natural disaster, and they were one of the first highly advanced civilizations in the world. They match up perfectly with descriptions of the Atlanteans. But living on an island has its dangers. The Minoans built their civilization around the volcano named Thera, right at the center of Santorini. It erupted between 1620 and 1530 BC. The explosion was so huge, it created a crater about four miles wide, sent ash over 20 miles into the atmosphere, and set off a tsunami that crashed into Egypt. The city of Akrotiri was buried under 200 feet of ash and debris and wasn't excavated until 1967. The Lost Kingdom of Ganja Nagara Ganja Nagara translates from Sanskrit to a city on the Ganges. 
It was the name of a legendary lost culture and their capital city. According to Malay Hindu historical records from the 15th and 16th centuries, the kingdom occupied modern Beruas, Dinding, and Manjung in Perak along the Malay Peninsula. The capital was supposedly based in Beruas, but the whole kingdom collapsed after an attack from the South Indian king Rajendra Chola I. That was in the 11th century, and it resulted in the destruction of the entire kingdom, all its people, and its capital. What makes all this so interesting is that there is not any archaeological evidence to support the legend of the Ganja Nagara. All we have are written tales of a place supposedly created by Raja Ganji Sarjuna, who claimed to be a descendant of Alexander the Great. In all likelihood, Ganja Nagara was a real place, perhaps a city-state in the Malay region, but it was too small and inconsequential to be recorded in any clarity and its legend has only survived because of the weak link to Alexander. Let me know in the comments below and be sure to come back soon for more videos. Bye!